Quick, name your favorite Disney witch. If you said anything other than Ursula from The Little Mermaid, well, you're obviously lying. Okay, okay, so maybe that's some personal bias seeping in there. But of the many wicked witches, evil enchantresses, and even just occasionally sassy sorceresses that the mouse-eared megalith has put forward over the years, Ursula definitely stands out as a memorable one. To begin with, she's got those awesome tentacles. And she's voiced by Broadway and classic Hollywood actress Pat Carroll. You can't go wrong with that. But the Disney version of the Sea Witch is only part of the story, and there's a lot more to tell. In this lesson from your friendly folk witches at Compass and Key and New World Witchery, we'll be looking at how the Sea Witch evolved from her literary fairy tale origins, and take a closer look at some of the magic from both on- and off-screen Sea Witches. Most people know that Disney's version of The Little Mermaid was based on a story by Danish author Hans Christian Andersen. Andersen's Little Mermaid was an original fairy tale, meaning he intentionally used pieces of folklore and created an original literary story, one designed to be read and re-read rather than told orally and passed along by word of mouth. Andersen wasn't alone in writing literary fairy tales, as others like Charles Perrault, Andrew Lang, and even L. Frank Baum of Wizard of Oz fame, all had a hand at crafting literary versions of fairy stories. The written version of The Little Mermaid, however, doesn't have a mermaid octopus sea witch. Would that be a merctopus? Octomaid? Help me out here. Instead, Anderson describes his sea witch this way. The Little Mermaid now came to a space of marshy ground in the wood, where large fat water snakes were rolling in the mire and showing their ugly, drab-colored bodies. In the midst of this spot stood a house built with the bones of shipwrecked human beings. There sat the sea witch, allowing a toad to eat from her mouth just as people sometimes feed a canary with a piece of sugar. She called the ugly water snakes her little chickens, and allowed them to crawl all over her bosom. While a house built from human bones may sound, well, more intense than what you see in the Disney film, it's really just a convenient building material gathered by the local botanical life. The place where the sea witch lives is surrounded by what Anderson calls polypi, creatures similar to the merfolk who messed up their deals in Disney's version and became gripping, grasping little sea plants around Ursula's lair. The polypi and the rolling water snakes, remember Flotsam and Jetsam, seem to be seeds from which Disney will sprout its incarnation of the story, but the two versions also differ significantly in respect to what the witches do. In Disney's version, Ursula is deviously planning to take over the kingdom of the merfolk by overthrowing Triton after she captures Ariel through some shady deal-making. Ariel's Faustian bargain, however, is not present in Anderson's fairy tale. The Sea Witch plainly warns the young mermaid that her desire to trade fins for legs will bring her misery. Every step you take will feel as if it were treading upon sharp knives, she says. In both versions, the payment is roughly the same. The Little Mermaid's voice. But while Disney makes the voice an ethereal, transferable, magical orb, Anderson's approach to muting his title character is much more direct. But I must be paid also, said the witch. And it is not a trifle that I ask. You have the sweetest voice of any who dwell here in the depths of the sea, and you believe that you will be able to charm the prince with it also, but this voice you must give to me. The best thing you possess will I have for the price of my draft. My own blood must be mixed with it, that it may be as sharp as a two-edged sword. Put out your little tongue, that I may cut it off as my payment. Then you shall have a powerful draft. Pretty gruesome, right? We'll come back to that potion in a minute, but for now we can leave the Sea Witch and say that Ariel, or the Little Mermaid's, fate is much different in the written version. Instead of defeating a monstrous Ursula in battle using, of all things, a sunken ship as a weapon, the Mermaid's Prince never really pays much attention to her. He weds someone else, and the Little Mermaid dissolves into tears in the ocean, after almost murdering the Prince and his bride on their honeymoon. Many people seem to think the story ends there, but Anderson gives the mermaid a reprieve, allowing her goodness of soul to earn her place among the Daughters of the Air, semi-immortal spirits who, unlike mermaids, can earn immortal souls and go to heaven eventually. 
Anderson was very concerned with the spiritual well-being of his non-human creatures. In many ways, the mermaids in Anderson's stories are water elementals, almost like the undines of Ovid's Metamorphoses. Transferring to the realm of air spirits is a sort of elemental step up in Anderson's thinking, moving from the realm of emotion to the realm of intellect, something that can still be seen in some alchemical or ceremonial magical practices. So, if the Little Mermaid eventually becomes an air spirit, where does that leave the Sea Witch? Well, it turns out that while she didn't have designs on the undersea throne, she does keep the royal family in check. When the mermaid sisters come to find out how they can help undo her bargain, the one that cost her literal tongue and resulted in constantly bleeding feet, remember, they trade their hair for a magical knife, the one the mermaid uses to try to kill the prince but can't, so I hope her sisters kept the receipt. The sea witch seems pretty fixated on body parts. She has a home made of bones not unlike some other witches who build or decorate with human bones, looking at you here, Baba Yaga, and she likes to collect tongues and hair and use them in her spells. Having a personal ossuary, a bone chapel basically, which are pretty cool places to visit, definitely adds to her witchy street cred, but the collection of the other parts is where the story taps into some real magic. For example, in North American hoodoo practices, one way to shut up an enemy is to take a cow's tongue and stuff it with pepper in the paper bearing the name of the intended target. Then sew it all up. Hair is also used a lot in folk magic, especially as a way to target magical work on a specific person. Don't ever let a suspected witch near your hairbrush, by the way. Anderson's witch also drips her own blackish blood into the cauldron when she makes the mermaid's potion but the final mixture comes out of the cauldron clear. Must be the good cleaning job she did with the knot of sea snakes tied together. In other North American lore, a different body part was often deployed by sea witches. The call, a membrane found over some newborn baby's heads, was collected by witches, who were also sometimes midwives and would thus have had some good access to newborns and their calls. The witches dried the coals and sold them to sailors as a way to ensure the sailor carrying the lucky talisman could not drown at sea. Because the coal had once held fluid around a baby's head, it was thought to provide permanent protection from drowning. The roiling snakes of Anderson's tail and Fotsam and Jetsam in Disney's telling are also all seeming examples of familiars, or spirits that obey a witch's desire and take on animal forms. In Ursula's case, she can even use their eyes as a way to see Ariel and spy on the Mer Kingdom. One of Ursula's last acts is summoning up a massive storm to try and destroy Ariel and her beloved Prince Eric. While that doesn't end so well for Ursula, weather magic was a major purview of the seaside witch in folklore. They were thought to be able to summon up the wind with a series of shrill whistles, or whipping seaweed around their head in a circle. Sailors could also gain their own wind in becalmed waters by throwing a coin overboard. Not too much, though, as buying the wind often resulted in wrecked ships from overzealous sailors with large denomination coins to burn. So, what should you do if you're eager to make Ursula your role model? Well, first, remember she's a villain, so put aside any pesky moral dilemmas for another time. Mm -hmm. Life's full of tough choices, isn't it? Be willing to do the spells you need to to get what you want and make sure that you review your Faustian bargain contract language. You could try some of the weather magic mentioned earlier, or you could try keeping some aquatic plants like American waterweed, or even do just a water planting of something like ivy. We won't say anything if you use those tenderly plants in your magic to bind up your enemies, Ursula Polypi style. And of course, you could always start storing your potions and spell ingredients in seashells. Dried anemones make great little pots for magical mixtures, and look pretty nifty too. If you do decide that Ursula or Anderson's Sea Witch are your personal magical mavens to emulate, we'd love to know what you do to bring that seaside sorcery into your life. Check out our link to an article on maritime magic in the notes below, and please, like, subscribe, and share this video with anyone who might be interested.